in the last lecture we had discussed regarding the place of swing and the jurisdiction of the court now the journey of filing a suit starts when we say that journey of the suit starts how it starts and in what manner it starts the party comes to you he, the party tells you all the facts relating to him then you are to select that on whose behalf the suit has to be filed and against whom the suit has to be filed what are the consequences of not joining the parties or what are the consequences when you join more than one plaintiff for one of the defendants and when what when and what are the powers of the court in case a necessary and proper party has not been joined in the suit so all these questions are contained in order 1 of the code of civil procedure which is the starting order of the code of civil procedure now this order consists of certain rules now rule 1 and 3 deal with the joinder of various plaintiffs and the defendants when there are more than one plaintiff or more than one defendant if the right to relief in respect of or arising out of the same act or transactions or series of acts now it should be arising out of the same act or transactions or series of acts then all those persons whether they are jointly or severally liable or they are liable in alternative they have to be joined as parties as plaintiffs to the suit similar is the case of the defendants that where there are the same act transactions or series of acts or transactions in respect of persons jointly and severally then certainly all those defendants may be joined or all those parties may be joined as defendants in the case so before starting with the plaintiffs we have to keep in mind certain basic fact as all of you know that there are two type of persons one is the human beings and one is the corporate persons corporate persons a company incorporated under the company name that is also considered to be a company then there are societies registered under the societies registration act which has been given the power to sue and be sued in its name then there are hindu undivided families in which the karta can file the suit on behalf of the hindu undivided family then comes the firms firms have also been given the power to sue and be sued against them now the condition is that the firm should be registered under section 69 of the partnership act at the time of filing of the suit and two or more persons who are shown to be the partners of the firm they have to be joined as plaintiffs in the suit and last but not the least persons who are minors or persons who are of unsound mind they can also file the suit minor has to file the suit through guardian similarly a person of unsound mind can also file a suit through guardian now as far as the guardians are concerned there are two type of guardians de facto guardian and de jure guardian de facto guardian means in whose custody or care and care is the minor or the person of unsound mind is He is known as a de facto guardian, whereas a de jure guardian is a person who has been appointed by the court under the relevant provisions of law to act on behalf of the minor or to act on behalf of the persons of unsound mind. Now, if we don't keep in view this principle, then certainly we are bound to lose the case because the plaintiffs are not proper. and the suit may be dismissed simply 
on the ground that it has not been properly instituted by a person who is competent in law to file the suit. Then when the court finds that there has been a misjoinder of the parties and the trial of the suit may embarrass or delay trial, then the court may order separate trial against one of the defendants or against all of the defendants in separate suits. So that power has been given. But the question, the guideline, the mantra of such is that it may embarrass or delay the trial of the suit. If it embarrasses the trial of the suit, if it delays the trial of the suit, then certainly the court has been given the power to order separate trials. Then comes if the defendants are not interested or all the defendants are not interested in the same suit, even then they can be joined so far as they are interested in the outcome of the suit. Then comes the joinder of parties or liable on the same contract. If there is a contract between the various parties, tripartite contract or multifarious contract between multifarious persons or oh, five, six, seven, eight persons, a joint contract has been entered into, then certainly the plaintiffs at his option may join the parties to the same suit or any of the persons severally or jointly or severally liable on any one contract including parties to the bills of exchange Hindis and promissory notes. So these are the three things it must relate to the bills of exchange that is promissory note Hindis and uh, bill of exchange means the checks Hindis and promissory notes per note. So if there are more than one persons then the plaintiff may at his option join parties to the same suit all or any of the persons who are severally or jointly liable for the same. Then comes rule 7. When the plaintiff is in doubt as to against whom he is to claim the relief, then he may file the suit against all the persons and ultimately when the court finds that plaintiff is entitled to relief against one or more than one defendant or part of the defendants, then certainly the remaining per defendants may be struck off from the list of parties and they may be ordered to be deleted from the array of parties and the relief can be granted against the persons against whom the plaintiff actually has the cause of action. Then comes the most important uh, rule, that is Rule 8. Rule 8 is a rule which is stated to be filing of the suit in a representative capacity. Representative capacity means there are more than one, more than one plaintiffs or there are more than one defendants who are interested in the same subject matter of the suit then any of the persons can file the suit in a representative capacity. He has to give the list of the persons again in whose favor or for whose favor the suit has, has, has been filed or the list of the defendants against whom the suit, of, the suit has been filed. Now if such a suit is filed, then what is the procedure? The, firstly, the permission of the court has to be obtained before the initiation of the suit. Now there are different views that the permission can be granted by the court at a later stage also. It is not fatal. It may be granted but as a matter of caution, the permission to file the suit should be obtained at the very start, at the very initiation of the suit. Then notice of the suit has to be given to all the plaintiffs or all the defendants now they can be served personally or through publication or any other mode by, by which they can be served and made aware of the fact that a suit has been filed by 
a certain person against or for benefit of a number of persons in whom they may be interested then all those plaintiffs or the defendants are at liberty to come to the court and join in the fi uh, filing prosecution or defending the suit then comes what happens if a plaintiff wants to burden the suit here comes order 23 as i have stated in my previous lectures that provisions of cpc are intermingled they are connected with each other they are not separate they have to be read in in conjunction with other orders at the relevant juncture suppose the plaintiff wants to burden the suit wants to compromise the suit then under order 23 rule 1 he is not permitted to do so he can do so only with the leave of the court and the court has to issue notice to all the persons that the plaintiffs who are present before the court wants to compromise the suit with the defendants and whether the suit or the compromise may be recorded or is in the benefit of the entire body of persons plaintiffs or the defendants then certainly after recording the satisfaction the court can allow the suit to be dismissed as withdrawn compromised or satisfied in any manner is as it it deems fit and the notice has to be given regarding the compromise at the expense of the plaintiff plaintiff has to bear all the expenses now a contingency arises when the persons on whose behalf the suit has been filed they are not there or any one of them dies or nobody is there to prosecute the suit or defend the suit then the court can allow that suit to be constituted because it is a representative suit it is not a suit in personal capacity it has been filed on the behalf of a body of persons who are interested in the result of the suit now question of in pleading of the representatives legal representatives under order 22 will not arise in this case why the question will automatically come to mind that their lrs can be allowed to be pleaded as a party because the suit has been filed in the personal capacity now when a suit is being filed in the personal capacity then right to sue or right to defend does not devolve upon the legal heirs the person dies this uh, right to sue dies along with that person so that person or the legal representative of that person cannot be allowed to be pleaded as a party to the suit but the court can substitute any other person having the same interest in the suit as a party to the suit to continue the suit so certainly the representative suit will not come to an end it has to be decided till the end now then rule comes if a decree is passed in such a suit it shall be binding on the persons on whose behalf the suit has been filed or against whom the suit has been filed so this judgment is a judgment in rem now you will certainly ask the question that what is the judgment in rem and what is the other form of judgment there are two type of judgments one is judgment in personam decree in personam or a decree in rem decree or judgment in personam means only the parties to the suit are bound by the adjudication made in the suit it is not binding on the third party whereas a judgment in rem is a adjudication or a suit which has been filed for the benefit of the public at large then that judgment being judgment in rem is binding on all the persons if some other person at a later stage after the decision of the suit 
wants to institute this suit on the same cause of action in which the adjudication has already been made by the court, then certainly he will be bound by the same and the said judgment cannot be again re-agitated or the same subject matter cannot be re-agitated. Here I would like to remind you that public interest litigation which is of recent origin in the writ jurisdiction is a replica of order 1 rule 8 CPC because the procedure of code of civil procedure is applicable to the writ petitions also. So in the writ petition also when public interest litigation is filed then certainly certain rules are there that two or more persons have to file they are to file it for the benefit of the public at large and that judgment is binding. So public interest litigation is the brainchild of the representative suit because it is applicable in the writ jurisdiction and any decision given in the writ jurisdiction is binding on the persons. Then rule 8a has been added when there is a question of law which is being which is being decided by the court and any person interested in the decision of the case or that question of law can file a suit you can be pleaded as a party to the suit and he can represent the case on his own behalf so that he may put forth his own viewpoint on the question of law. So this is a new addition. Then rule 9 that is very important. It says that no suit shall be defeated by misjoinder or non-joinder of parties. Now misjoinder means a party who is not a necessary party to the suit, who has been wrongly joined as a party to the suit. And non-joinder means a party who ought to have been joined as a party to the suit has not been implemented as a party to the suit. So it says that no suit shall be defeated by the misjoinder or non-joinder of parties and the court may decide the list, may decide the dispute between the parties so far as it is practicable to do so in the presence of the parties who are before the court. A proviso has been added to this that nothing in this rule shall apply to non-joinder of necessary parties, meaning thereby that the uh, decision of the suit is going to be affected if a party who is a necessary and proper party to the suit has not been joined and then the suit is bound to be dismissed. Now the question will arise if a suit has been dismissed only on the ground that a necessary party has not been joined as a party to the suit. Will it operate as a res judicator under section 11 of the code of civil procedure? The answer is a mixed question. Why it is a mixed question? If the suit has been dismissed solely on this ground that the suit is bad for non-joinder of necessary party and no adjudication on merits have been given. Then certainly, the second suit, if it is permissible under the law, within limitation and all that conditions, then certainly it will not operate as adjudicator. But if the findings on merits have been given, then it may operate as adjudicator. The party whose suit has been uh, dismissed on the ground that it is bad for non-joinder of necessary parties, can bring a fresh suit on the same cause of action. Then comes Rule 10. Rule 10 is the foundation of the entire Order 1 of the CPC. It gives power to the court under various acts. If the suit has been filed in the name of the wrong person, as we have discussed in the earlier part of this lecture that suit has been filed on behalf of the minor without permission 
firm is not properly sued or corporation has not been properly sued and all that then certainly that error can be corrected because it is a clerical error it is not irregularity it is not illegality but it is only an irregularity and irregularity can be cured but illegality cannot be cured so if the suit has been brought in the name of a wrong person then it can be allowed to be corrected then the power has been given to the court to strike out or to add any party to the suit whose presence the court thinks fit that he ought to have been joined as a party and if the court thinks that such a such party has been properly joined as a party to the suit then the court may order striking out the name of that person and may order the joining of a party to the suit whose presence is required now no person shall be added as a plaintiff suing without a next friend or the next friend of the plaintiff under any liability without any without his consent if a minor has filed the suit himself a guardian is appointed then the consent of the guardian has to be taken no person can be forced to become a guardian of the person minor or person of unfound mind why there are certain liabilities attached to the uh, appointment as a guardian because he is liable for certain acts and a person may not be willing to carry out that responsibility or shoulder that responsibility in that eventuality if there is no such relative then the court may appoint a court guardian to look after and carry forward the suit then comes question when the defendant is added the plaint has to be amended unless and until the court says there is no necessity to amend the plaint meaning thereby that amendment of the court describing that why the defendant has been added has to be done by the plaintiff and it is a mandatory duty passed upon the plaintiff to make the amendment in the plaint then comes the question of limitation that is a very important question law of limitation that is the limitation act is a substantive law it is not a procedural law because code of civil procedure is a procedural law whereas limitation act is a substantive law now substantive law applies to the code of civil procedure it says that when the summons are served on the newly added defendant the suit will be deemed to have been commenced against that defendant only on the date of service of this summons and if the suit is time barred on the date when the summons are served on the defendant then the defendant is at liberty to take all those such defenses in response to the allegations made in the plaint so then as far as the question of objection regarding non jointer and mis jointer of parties is concerned it has to be taken at the earliest before the settlement of issues and unless and until it has been taken at the relevant time it will, it will be deemed to have been waived by the party meaning thereby that part plaintiff for the defendant has to be vigilant regarding order 1 rule 10 uh, 13 in which this objection has been so grafted now selection of parties selection of suit is not a simple task we can say that no order 1 is nothing no no it is a very substantive law it is a complete code in itself as far as the parties are concerned you can say that only in 13 rules the entire procedure for in pleading of a parties defendants etc etc has been summarized by the legislature that is why the cpc has been divided into various orders 
because each order defines a particular details of the procedure to be followed so order 13 so order 1 provides for the parties itself so this is a very important section when the party comes to you when the client approaches you then it is the duty of the advocate to select as to how the suit has to be filed on whose behalf the suit has to be filed in what manner the suit has to be filed, everything has to be taken care of. Whether the suit has to be filed in a representative capacity, if what is the effect of non joinder of necessary parties, and all that. Then there is also one rule 10A which has been added in 1977, which is the rule of amicus curiae which was earlier applicable before the Honorable High Court that if a suit is there, if a list is there before the court and the court wants that a particular advocate should assist the court in decision of the matter which is of importance, utmost importance on the question of law and fact then it can fix the duty of an advocate as amicus curiae who will assist the court in deciding the matter so this rule 10A has been added by the legislature for assisting the trial courts to decide the matter whenever a question of utmost legal or factual importance comes into uh, question before it. So conduct of the suit has to be given by the court to any person as it deems proper. So as far as this rule is concerned, rule 11, it deals only with rule 8 where the representative suit has to be, has been filed. So when we take an overall view of order 1 then we will come to this conclusion that it is a code this is a complete code in itself regarding the parties so I hope that you must have you must be going through this order in the way we have interpreted it because there are certain things which are not there in the CPC which have been added by me from my own experience please give your comments and if there are any queries I would like to answer those queries please share and subscribe to my channel for getting the lectures on law on CPC I will be glad to address you on other subjects also after we finish of the code of civil procedure please also purchase my book become a successful advocate when you intend to join practice or when you intend to join the law college it will help you from the date of choice of profession date of joining of the college how you are to overcome the shortcomings that all that everything has been given in detail from personal experiences, from other experiences of the other persons in the other fields. Thanking you all.